for this video, we finally have enough information to build up to get to the main point of the chapter. With this last section, we'll have a few videos for calculations in practice, but our goal has been to be able to calculate what are the equilibrium quantities for every substance in a given chemical equation. We finally have enough information to put all of this together now. So if we are given initial concentrations or pressures, we can use either unit. We most commonly use concentrations. If we're given initial concentrations and an equilibrium constant, then we can set up a table that allows us to solve for the equilibrium concentrations or pressures of all the substances in a chemical reaction. We are going to use what are called ice tables. This is everybody's favorite topic from Chem 152. We'll be referring to ice tables for most of the rest of our semester. With ice tables, a key thing about units is that we have to use molarities. So if we're given moles, we need to convert that into molarity. And again, a reminder that molarity is calculated as moles per liter. Or we can use gas pressures. Any units that are given are acceptable. The units of pressure are not mandatory. As we set up problems to solve for equilibrium concentrations or amounts, we have these steps that are required to help ensure you don't skip any steps. So we're always going to start by writing our balanced equation, of course. We set up an ice table underneath that. We'll be writing our equilibrium expressions and then plugging equilibrium values into that expression. Once we do that, it'll give us a math equation that allows us to solve for x, which will allow us to calculate equilibrium quantities. So refer back to this slide for the five steps to follow to solve for equilibrium quantities. So as an example, we're going to work through this scenario to demonstrate an ice table and how we would use our five steps on the previous slide. We're told that we start with one molar hydrogen and one molar iodine gas, and we want to know all equilibrium concentrations. So realize we have to be given the balanced chemical equation. For this one, if we're asked to solve for equal, equilibrium amounts, we have to be given a K value. We will see that there's a variation in a problem where we can have enough information where we actually solve for K, though. And of course, recognize that because our K values are temperature dependent, we'll often be given temperature in these problems. Again, not that we're using it, but just to have it there as a reference. To make sure I have enough space, I'm going to rewrite our chemical equation. So remember, our first step in our setup is to write our balanced chemical equation. Directly underneath that equation, we are going to set up an ice table. The I stands for initial, how much we start with. The C stands for change, how much they're going to change by. And the E, of course, stands for equilibrium. In our problem here, we are told that we start with 1.00 molar hydrogen and 1.00 molar iodine. Now realize for calculator purposes, adding those zeros in doesn't really help. However, when we get to sig figs in our last step, it's going to be very helpful to remind yourself how many digits you started with. So I always like to write the full and complete value in my table here. Since those were the only two that I was told, the only assumption I can make is that I'm not starting with any hydrogen iodide. Again, remember, this is initial. This is how much we're putting into the container. So if we're not told anything, we can only assume zero. Now our change line. The amount of change is unknown. So this is where we're going to introduce an X. But we do know relative amounts of change. Remember back from kinetics, we could actually figure out based on the coefficients, the relative amounts of change of substances. So on our change line, there's two things we have to pay attention to. One is which direction this reaction is going. Well, if my product starts at a zero, that has to increase. I have to produce something for HI, but however big or small that value is, it has to increase. So if my products are increasing, it means my reactants have to decrease. 
A helpful hint here, if you put a squiggle line under your arrows, that will help serve as a reminder that you have to have opposite signs on opposite sides of your equation. Again, we're saying this reaction is going to the right. That means our reactants have to decrease and our products have to increase. So the signs are the first thing on our change line. The second thing is the amount of change. Again, I don't know exactly how much, but I know that hydrogen and iodine are going to change by the same amount because they have the same coefficients, a one-to-one -one ratio. And I know that HI is going to change by twice that because of its coefficient. So on our change line, we have signs, and then we're using our coefficient as our uh, multiple of x. Now the equilibrium line is super easy because we're literally just adding those two together. And although these are called ice tables, I actually like to call them icy tables. A, because ices are way more fun. And B, because it's a reminder to go back in once you solve for X, to actually plug your X value back in and get your final quantity for each one of these. And so what I want to do is go ahead and finish this problem out so that we can see what our other steps are. So we have done steps one and two, balanced equation, ice table down here. Going back to our previous slide, step three is to write our equilibrium expression and then plug equilibrium values into that. So jotting down a few key things here, we have our balanced equation. So again, step three is writing our equilibrium expression. You should be pros at this by now, doing it in your sleep. So we have hydrogen iodide squared on top, hydrogen and iodine first order on the bottom. That's step three. Step four is to now plug in our equilibrium quantities from this third line into that expression. So realize we've determined that this is how much we'll end up with at equilibrium, and I've also determined that this is the equation they go into. So HI we solved as 2x at equilibrium, but remember that gets squared. Hydrogen is 1.00 minus x, as is iodine. And in our original question, we were given the value of Kc as 50.5. I'll go back to that slide again to point it out. So realize we were given the value of Kc. And so that means we can set all of this equal to that equilibrium constant. Now notice we have simply a math problem to work here. So simplifying everything on one page, here's the neat version, our ice table, our expression, our equilibrium values, and set equal. And now our goal is to solve this. So I'm actually going to show one of the shortcuts that we use. If you take a look at the setup that we have here, we have a second order polynomial. So we could use the quadratic formula to solve for this. And if you're making a scrunchy face right now, that's perfectly valid. I agree. I'm not going to use the quadratic. But notice that I can actually rewrite my denominator as a square, right? I have the exact same quantities here. And so it turns out that I can actually use a shortcut method called perfect squares. Because both the numerator and denominator are squared quantities, what that means is I can take the square root of both sides and then solve for x. Again, at this point, we simply have a math problem. And so I encourage you to go through the steps to solve for this. I am going to write down a few steps here to go through the math to solve for x. Feel free to fast forward through this part of the video.
when you get down to a value of x, you should have with extra digits 0 0.78040. Two things to note about this number. One is sig figs. Going back to our original question, notice we were given three sig figs for molarity and three for k. So k values also count for sig figs. If x was my final answer, which it's not, it would be rounded to three sig figs. And also remember that x has to be molarity. Because the values in our ice table are molarity, right? we started with molarity. If I'm going to subtract values, they have to be the same units. And so everything in this table is units of molarity. And so I know my value of x. Now my last step in this problem is to go back to my very first ice table, this is where I want to plug my x value in to solve for each quantity. So here's where we pay attention to sig figs. Realize my very last step is subtraction. So I have 1.00 minus my x of 0 0.780, but I'm limited to two decimal places. And so for hydrogen and iodine, I get 0.22 molar. For my last step for H, I am multiplying 2 times X. The 2 does not count for sig figs, so this is where I pay attention to the sig figs of X. That goes to 3, and so my answer for HI will go to 3. And so my final answers for these are listed here. Now in the slides, I've left the, the table and all the answers. This is the summary of everything that we solved for. And a note on our x, since we use square roots, you technically get a positive and negative root. We'll obviously only use the positives in here because we can't have negative concentrations or pressures. We also don't want to round at x. It's rarely our final answer. So you can either report your final answers in your ice table if you add that fourth row, or you can report them individually like I've shown here. And then the last important question, how can you tell or estimate if your answers make sense? And this is where we look at our k value. So recognize we have a k that is bigger than 1. It's not a terribly large value, but it's bigger than 1. And that means I should have slightly more products than reactants. When I look at my final answers, I do have slightly more products than I do reactants. The other way to check my answer is to plug these values back into my KC expression. I won't do it here, but I'll leave it for you to check. This is always a great way to check and make sure everything works out right. Plug those values back in, and you should get close to your KC value. It might be off by a little bit because of rounding, but it should be really, really close to that value. And so this is our introduction to ice tables. We'll work a couple more examples or quite a few more examples in the next videos to practice more.